ان الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما After praising Allah Azza wa Jal while recognizing we never fully can and testifying to his unique oneness and to the finality of the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and reminding myself and you with the taqwa of Allah to live consciously of Allah and dutifully to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and welcoming you all anew to the blessed house of Allah the mighty and majestic my brothers and sisters when Allah Azza wa Jal called back his prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in death this was the greatest calamity the earth has ever and will ever endure the most tragic event in the history of the human experience and the sahaba for which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was their everything many of which in medina when the news left his apartment their legs could no longer carry their weight and they fell and hysteria began to spread and when news reached abu bakr as-siddiq radiyallahu anhu was a bit distant at that hour he made his way quickly and entered through the crowds addressing no one and went straight into the house of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he uncovered his blessed face sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam and kissed him between his blessed eyes sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said tibta hayyan wa mayyitan ya rasulullah you are forever blessed whether the, this body of yours is alive or dead o messenger of allah you are blessed in your life and in your death and allah will never gather cause you to experience death twice he will not, never gather two deaths for any one person meaning alhamdulillah it's over you will never have to go through it again it had to happen and then he covered his blessed face sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he walked out and at this point some of the sahaba like umar radiyallahu an their grief or their shock had transformed into rage and umar became in denial and he began to yell at the people whoever said muhammad has died is a liar he has only gone off to meet Allah the same way that Moses had a special meeting with Allah and he will come back and he will punish anyone who said he has died anyone who has lied about him wallahi he hasn't died and so Abu Bakr walked out and he said oh you who was swearing ayyuh al-halif sit down and he stood in front of the people and he said to them his famous words whomever used to worship Muhammad know that Muhammad has died sallallahu alaihi wasallam and whomever worships allah know that allah is the living that never dies and then he recited the ayah wa ma muhammadun illa rasulun qad khalat min qablihi ar-rusul and muhammad is but a messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam messengers came to pass and passed away before him too afa in mata aw qutila qalabtum ala aqabikum if he were to die or be killed will you turn your backs on your heels turn your back on allah and the deen وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرَّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا And whomever turns their back will not harm Allah in the least. وَسَيَجِزِ اللَّهُ الشَّاكِرِينَ And Allah will certainly reward in full those who are grateful. Why was Abu Bakr radiallahu an able to handle it better than Umar? It could not be because his love for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was weaker than the love of Umar. That couldn't be it, because Abu Bakr is the undisputed number one, and between him and second place is an immeasurable distance. It's not that his love was weaker; 
It's that his piety was stronger. Without taking anything away from that class of the Sahaba who were truly unique by Allah's testimony, the best community ever brought out for humanity. But when it compared to Abu Bakr, it's a different ball game altogether, a different measurement altogether. And this is what I wish to, to linger on in these few minutes. One of the greatest signs, manifestations of piety, of true religiosity, is when your emotions and what the deen asks of you go in separate directions. Everyone's pious when things are easy, when things are comfortable, when things are aligned with what they're used to or what they like. But when something happens that shakes you, shakes your emotions, drills at you, knocks you off, the people of piety are those who align their emotions with the deen. They don't get blurry on the deen because of their emotions. That is the idea. And then they buried him sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And then his daughter Fatima radiallahu anha said, Ya Anas, kayfa tabat anfusukum? Oh Anas, how could you? How could your souls bear and tahthul turaba ala wajhi rasulillah? How could your souls bear to throw dirt on the blessed face of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How could you get yourself to do it? And Anas did not, you know, respond back to her because he knew she was not saying this out of real objection. She knew this because she knew how much he meant to us, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So she expected us to struggle with this. But she understood at the end of the day, and he knew from her she was just grieving. And that is why he didn't respond. He knew that us being so emotionally devastated by the death does not mean we're, not, we're going to dishonor the deceased and not bury them. Burial is an honor. And that is why Allah legislated it. Imagine, imagine, of course, the Prophet ﷺ's body is special and different. And Allah would not allow the earth to cause it to deteriorate. We know that clearly. But imagine someone else, we love them so much that we can't stand to bury them. That would be a dishonoring of them. To leave them out to dry, leave them out in the air, leave them to decompose and change, deteriorate right in front of us. And so that is why you checking where the emotions are is, is so important. How much do they dictate your decisions? You know, they learned this from the Prophet ﷺ himself. In Sahih Muslim, both of these hadith were in Sahih Bukhari. In Sahih Muslim, Ibn Mas'ud, عن, he said that we were on a journey between Mecca and Medina, and the Prophet ﷺ stopped somewhere. And he cried and cried so intensely that everyone around him broke down. And then, without knowing why, and then he explained to them how it all started. He said to them, استأذنت ربي أن أستغفر لأمي فلم يأذن لي. I sought permission from my Lord to seek forgiveness for my mother. This was his mother's grave. صلى الله عليه وسلم. Whom he lost at six years old. صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. I sought forgiveness for my mother or permission to seek forgiveness and Allah did not grant it to me. She was among those who turned away from what had reached her of what was left of the, the religion of Ibrahim salam. So she was liable and so I couldn't seek forgiveness for her. And then I sought his permission to visit her grave and that he permitted me, he said. And so now visit the graveyards فَإِنَّهَا تُذَكِّرُ الْمَوْتِ Because it will all help you remember death. It will all help you remember your meeting with Allah and how Tawheed is number one. And how even if you, you were related to the Prophet ﷺ himself, this is the separator. You have to go in with your own tawheed. But notice how emotionally moved he was, and yet he did not overstep when it came to the rights of Allah ﷺ. Sometimes we say, don't get so emotionally you know, out of whack that you violate others. Don't get so emotionally imbalanced that you violate the greatest rights. The rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, these three examples do have death in common, the death of the Prophet Sallallahu the death of his mother, but it's not just about death. It is every decision that you make because we are just emotional beings. It's always on. And Islam doesn't tell you to turn it off. That's very important. We don't come from a Stoic tradition or the Stoic philosophy, which basically tells people emotions are unreliable, emotions are dangerous, turn off your emotions. No. 
You know, some people try not to get happy at all just so they don't get sad at all. <laughs> they just try to turn it off. And that's a cop-out. And uh, human emotion is, is, is an asset. It's, a, it's a, a great tool. And it is a great blessing of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it is a, a form of human intelligence that we uniquely have. But when push comes to shove, when you're at your decisions, how does that play out? At every decision. When someone burns the Qur'an somewhere to seek your attention and manipulate your reactions across the globe somewhere, how do you react? Right? Are you measured? Are you calculated? Are you balanced? Or when someone burns your fantasy about exactly how your kids are going to grow up and then what degree they're going to have and what profession they're going to enjoy and exactly which person they're going to marry, when that goes up in flames and you feel so betrayed, will you know your limits? And realize that your emotions are not the by all end all? Or are you going to burn things down with you? You know, speaking of that, that subject of emotions and love and marriage, in Sahih al-Bukhari and elsewhere, there was a woman named Barira who was a slave, who Aisha radiallahu anha spent on her freedom. She liberated her. She emancipated her. Her husband, Mughith, remained a slave. He was still among the slave class. So it was her right to not want to be tied down with this man and his limitations, his social limitations. So she left him. But Mughith was head over heels in love with his wife. Ibn Abbas says he would walk after her in the streets, pleading with her to take him back. He would walk circles around her crying, begging her with his beard, grown man, soaked in tears, please, please take me back. To the point that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to his, uh, his uncle Al-Abbas, he said, Amma ta'jab, isn't it crazy? It's so sober, surprising. Hubbu mughithin bariratan wa bughdu bariratin mughitha. Isn't it crazy how much he loves her <laughs> and how much she hates him at the same time? Same exact time, she can't stand him and he just can't stop loving her. And then he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ma I don't find any solution better for those that are in love, like whenever possible, just to get them married. Whenever possible, get them married, help. And so he led by example, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he approached her. He went to Barira and he said to her, I want to take the guy back. I know technically you're, but like, just let him, take him back. She said to him, and so notice, he's, he's sympathizing with someone in love. It's, he's emotionally alive, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? But when she said, أَتَأْمُرُنِي يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Are you commanding me? Like, is this like a religious instruction? He said, إِنَّمَا أَنَا شَافِعٍ No, 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 I'm just trying to be a middleman here. I'm not saying this as a prophet. I'm saying this as a well-wisher. I'm, I'm just stepping in between, trying to help out, trying to vouch for the guy. إِنَّمَا أَنَا شَافِعٍ And so... He, she said to him, لا حاجة لي فيه. I have no need for him. <laughs> I'm above that. New life, new me, moving on to bigger and better things. What happened? He stopped. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He did not see himself, the messenger of God, entitled to overstep, usurp from her her autonomy, her choice to choose who she wants to live with. And he is who he was. Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. Right? Think about that. You know, this is not a small issue. You know, uh, it, it's not just 400 years ago that some guy named Rene Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. No, no, this is very alive. It's very alive. People now see themselves. Their sense of identity is purely based on how they feel. That's a problem. That's a humongous problem. I feel, therefore I am, right? I need to reshape reality based on my fancies, which are all over the place. The danger of emotions that things change every day. So how do you make a permanent decision based on these temporary emotions? Forget other people disagreeing. You're going to disagree with yourself in 10 minutes or 10 days. You're about to. And so to refine it in the prophetic way, to regulate it as he taught us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a profound objective of our sharia. May Allah azza wa guide us and you to it. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah al-azim li wa lakum. الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده شهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله 
The fifth and final example I will share to begin this subject, and it deserves khutbah after khutbah, inshallah, we will spend some time on it, hoping Allah guides us through it. Zainab was either the first child of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, either her or al-Qasim, she was definitely his first daughter, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wasallam, Zainab bint Muhammad. When her husband Abu al-As was on a trip, the Messenger of Allah became the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Revelation came to him. She, of course, embraced Islam immediately. Her husband comes home, what happened? I became Muslim. He said, you know, your father's a good man, but I'm not accepting Islam. You see, because peer pressure doesn't just pressure kids, right? He couldn't handle the, the emotional chastisement, the humiliation that his peers would level against him. So anyway, he said, I'm not going to be a Muslim. The Muslims flee from persecution eventually and migrate all the way to Medina. Two th years later, the Battle of Badr takes place. Despite the disadvantage, Allah gives the Muslim this great victory at Badr. Among those taken captive by the Muslims was her husband, Abu al-As. And she's still in Mecca. She had to stay back with her husband. And so the Muslims now are receiving deliveries of offerings, ransoms, so that their relatives could be let go. And so among those packages, they received from Zainab a necklace so that they would free her husband, leave her husband. When the Prophet wasallam saw this necklace, he broke down, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He emotionally broke down. Because this was the necklace of Khadija radiallahu anha that she had gifted to her first daughter on her wedding night. <clears throat> and so it brought back everything. Khadija. And so he went to the Sahaba when he saw this necklace and he said to them, In ra'aytum an tutliqu laha asiraha wa taruddu alayha malaha. If you guys think it's all right, Free her captive for her, let her husband go, and also send back just graciously her, her property to her. Notice how he said that, sallallahu alayhi It's your right. As emotionally charged as I am at this moment, what am I going to do? Usurp your right? These were the leftovers, the spoils of war. These, this army came out to end your lives. And so naturally you survived and this is what they left behind. It's your right in Allah's eyes. So I can't impose on you, no matter how I feel right now, to accept this. So if you guys think it's all right, let, her go, let the man go and just send back her again. And of course the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, seeing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa like this, they did exactly that. And then he sent a message with Abu al-As to be gracious as well and to send over his daughter to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When she was put on the camel to head to Medina, two men, Habbar ibn al-Aswad and a man by the name of Nafi' refused to let her go. They chased after the camel. Like, no, he just devastated us at Badr. He's not going to have his daughter back. And they ran after the camel and began prodding and stabbing the camel with their spears from behind until the camel tossed her off. And she fell and she miscarried. She lost her baby and she had to be taken back to the family of her husband, her former husband, the deceased Abu al-As, to take care of her and she ultimately later got to her father. But she continued to suffer from hemorrhaging, from bleeding and sickness and weakness until in the eighth year, and this is important, Bedr was in the second. So the second and third year after the migration, she gets there, then dies in the eighth year and only in the eighth year does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, you go to those two men and you burn them alive. You would think as a father, you would have said that five years ago, but she hadn't died yet. So it was an eye for an eye yet. But that wasn't just it. After he said that and the, the death squad was heading out, to exact justice on these two murderers and these warmongers, Allah reveals to him and he stops the squad. And he says to them, I said burn them alive. And Allah said, 
Nobody burns people alive. Nobody burns people with fire but the creator of fire. Go kill them, but not by fire. Even that recant, that ability, alayhi salatu wasalam. And so they head out, and before they could reach Habbar ibn al Aswad, the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal reached him, as they say. He becomes Muslim and he migrates to Medina. And somehow, the Prophet وسلم, is able to accept him as his brother in Islam. After all of that. And so, how do we get ourselves anywhere near these ideals? How do we refine our emotions in that prophetic way? How do we make sure we retain our emotions, this beautiful component of human beings that Allah gave us, while not getting burned by it when it flares, right? When it, 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 it gets fired up. Inshallah, we will spend the khutab on that, but just keep that in mind. Try your best, however you can think of it. Exercise it. Know that when the dust clears and on the day of judgment you arrive, there's going to be these moments. They could have been blink of an eye moments. When you accept it to be uncomfortable. To say this, admit it. Or not say that, hold it back. Or wear this, even though you're not used to. Or not wear that, even though you've been doing it for years. To accept this, to quit that against your comfort. That could be what makes all the difference. You show up on the Day of Judgment, you did it. Did what? That. Moment of conquer. Moment of conquest. May Allah Azza wa Jal grant us many of those moments before we meet Him. Allahumma ameen. May Allah Azza wa Jal forgive us our past and our future sins. May Allah Azza wa Jal guide our hearts and our minds always. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure our sick and clear us of debts and have mercy on our deceased. May Allah Azza wa Jal grant us firmness when that is required of us. And may Allah grant us strong resolve upon doing the right things always. May Allah guide us to the best decision at every crossroad and help us ride his path in the most straightforward fashion. Allahumma ameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka wa Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.